Hello and welcome to Syria Talks, the unique show exploring the intricacies of the Syria crisis. I'm your host, Danny Mackey. With the Islamic State continuing to pose a threat to the security of all the nations in the Middle East and far beyond, Turkey has further upped the ante by carrying out airstrikes against a group on the Syrian side of the border. For the first time since the start of the Syria conflict, Turkish F-16 fighter jets bombed Islamic State positions following the deadly attack reaching into Turkey's Kilis province that prompted military jets to fly over the area. The bombing is a strong tactical shift for Turkey, which has been long reluctant to join the US-led coalition against the Islamic State. Meanwhile, the US plans an assault to seize back Ar Ramadi province from ISIS in Iraq, with US Defense Secretary Ashton Carter arriving in Iraq to discuss the strategies as Iraqi forces begin isolation operations on the city captured by the Islamic State in May. To discuss the war on ISIS, let me introduce Zaid Laisa, a political commentator, and Eric Dreitzer, a geopolitical analyst and founder of StopImperialism.org. But before we begin, let's take a quick look at this video report on the latest in the war on ISIS. As Syria's war continues to rage, the historical landmarks give a stark reminder of how important the country is in the Middle East. Krak des Chevaliers and Kalat Salah El Din are unique examples of an age where the world looked towards the East and in particular, Syria. These two castles represent the most significant examples illustrating the exchange of influences and documenting the evolution of fortified architecture in the Near East during the time of the Crusades the 11th to 13th centuries. The Crec des Chevaliers was built by the Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem from 1142 to 1271. With further construction by the Mamluks in the late 13th century, it ranks among the best preserved examples of the Crusader castles. During the Syria conflict, the castle was under siege by the Syrian armed forces after a group of Al-Qaeda-linked Jund al-Sham militants took the strategic fortress. Minimal damage was shown in the aftermath of the battle, which drew condemnation far and wide. Zaid, if we could start with you, how would you assess the war on ISIS as we speak? Well, uh, as we can clearly see that the war on ISIS is not making any major headway till now. I mean, we have to see, we have to consider that it's been nearly a year since uh, the U.S. started its uh, uh, futile strategy of actually launching airstrike. It started, uh, started off as a response to ISIS changing direction and moving from uh, surging towards Baghdad to actually moving towards Erbil, which it perceived as a strategic uh, as a strategic blow to its interest in Erbil. That's when it actually decided to launch airstrikes while it was happy standing on the sidelines and sitting idly by why ISIS actually threatened to uh, move into Baghdad. It was only the uh, pop, uh, popular mobilization forces which answered the call of the Grand Ayatollah Sistani, which thwarted and foiled all attempts to, uh, of ISIS actually to move uh, into Baghdad and to threaten Baghdad. It managed to hold them back and then push them back uh, towards uh, Tikrit. The Americans started uh, bombing in Erbil and then actually demanded that the Iraqis form a new Mm. more inclusive government and we're happy to, uh, to sit idly by until mm. the formation, formation of this government on the 15th of September. Still, I can safely say that the airstrikes have been mm. merely window dressing. They, have, they neither intensified nor actually gathered any frequency or pace. It was basically designed to show the rest of the world that they are doing something against ISIS. Now, how the linked, reality how is... Linked? How linked are the struggles in Syria and Iraq? They are actually quite linked. They are inseparable and they are inextricably linked. It actually was uh, uh, ISIS, uh, all the uh, previously called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, that have uh, moved at the behest of Saudi Arabia, calling itself Jabhat al-Nusra from Iraq into Syria. Uh, that was Ayman al-Zawari as well, calling it uh, on it to turn Syria into the main battlefield, which is something that the Saudis saw as an opportunity, as a 
an opportunity to actually revive uh, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was reeling and an, on its back heel. So it provided an, an, a window of opportunity to arm, finance, Jabhat al-Nusra, which according to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is nothing but uh, the foot soldiers and, uh, and simply a branch of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And Abu Muhammad Julani is one of its uh, foot soldiers. So it, it, the, the, the strategy of Saudi Arabia was to focus and concentrate on its strategic goal of toppling the regime in Syria. But that was actually futile. And mm. when they didn't make any headway, they widened the strategy when Bandar bin Sultan took up the uh, uh, leadership of the, the intelligence ministry in Saudi Arabia to mm. actually encompass Iraq, accusing of Iraq of uh, uh, providing the backbone uh, mm. of uh, support to okay, the if we, if we could take this if we could take this to Eric now. Um, before we get on to the US side of, of, of the matter, I'd like to ask you a question about Turkey. I mean, a, as you know, Turkey has now allowed the United States to use its air bases to attack ISIS positions across the border in Syria. Now, how do you see Turkish policy towards Syria in light of this recent emergency event? Well, I think that this is a really this is a really important question, primarily because there's a somewhat of a deflection, especially in the Western media and the portrayal of this issue. Because what they're essentially trying to say, and the narrative that they're trying to cement, is that Turkey is now merely allowing the United States to use bases. But in fact, just in recent days, we have reports from inside of Syria of Turkish airstrikes against Syrian targets in the Al Hasaka province in northeastern Syria. This is now confirmed by uh, very by various mainstream media sources. So the Turkish military, Turkish Air Force, are actively engaged in the violation of Syrian sovereignty in the Hasaka mm -hmm. province in the northeast, as well as in the Idlib province on the other side of the Turkish border, where Turkey, and this has been confirmed by numerous sources, has been directly providing air support and indeed also ground support for terrorist forces that it has hosted inside of Turkey that have crossed over the border into Syria. So I would rephrase and rephrase this issue of Turkish participation as not merely supporting U.S. airstrikes into Syria, but actually actively taking part in fomenting this war and being an active participant in this war. Remember that Turkey has been involved in fomenting this mm. war really from the very beginning. We, of course, have those reports from 2012 that uh, were published by the New York Times that Turkey was hosting Syrian Muslim Brotherhood agents that were working mm. with the CIA to funnel the weapons into to Syria. We know, of course, the terrorist base at the uh, Turkish city of Adana, which is right near the NATO mm. base at Incirlik. We know that Turkey has been one of the most active participants in calling for regime change and, of course, sending Turkish military numerous times into Turkey, all documented by mainstream media sources. So I think that this is really mm. simply an extension, a continuation of the same Turkish policy, and in this case, now allowing direct U.S. use of their Air Force assets and of these bases. Mm. And that's really all this is, merely an escalation of the participation mm. of the United now, now States this escalation you discuss, in Turkey. This escalation you discuss, I mean, how does it end up? Because after the terrorist attack on Turkey, Turkey has unveiled plans to build a concrete wall along the border with Syria, the 560-mile border, in fact. How significant will, will this new project actually be in helping to stop extremists entering Syria? It's an absurd argument. It's, it, mm. it's, it's absurd on its face because Turkey is facilitating the crossing of these terrorists into Syria. They're hosting them and they facilitate them. And all of this has come out in, in, in not only in mainstream media reports, this has come out in Turkish court. We have wiretaps, we have publications like Kumburian in Turkey who have actually published the accounts of MIT, that is Turkish intelligence, being involved directly in sending terrorists over the border into Syria, providing trucks and convoys and protection for these same terrorists, and this has all come out in Turkish courts and in Turkish media, and in fact, uh, President Erdogan himself has called for a life sentence for the editor of the paper mm. that broke this story inside of Turkey. So just pulling back from that, the notion mm. that Turkey would be wanting to stop 
terrorist infiltration. This is an absolute outrage. This is a, an affront against truth because, in fact, Turkey has been hosting them, Turkey has been facilitating them, and Turkey is actively mm -hmm. engaged in fomenting this. What they're actually mm -hmm. doing, rather, is they would like to stem the tide of refugees. They would like to be able to politically extricate themselves from any responsibility for a war that they continue to foment and a war that they continue to okay, win. Okay, Eric, That's hold, really hold that thought saying. for a second. We'll get back to you on this particular issue. If we could take this to Zayd al Isa now, the ISIS suicide, linked suicide bombing in Turkey was the worst case of violence spilling over from the Syria crisis into Turkey. Just how entrenched is Turkey now in the Syria conflict? Well, I mean, Turkey is actually deeply entrenched in what's happening in Syria and actually uh, providing a lifeline to ISIS and all extremist groups, including Jabhat al-Nusra, which is part and parcel of ISIL uh, in terms of having and sharing the same hardline extremist Wahhabi Salafi ideology. The only differences between them is about power and influence and actually about uh, squabbling about resources that they receive from the same supporters and that is mainly Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now Turkey has been working in conjunction, uh, working hand in glove with Saudi Arabia and Qatar and this has actually intensified after the change in the leadership in Saudi Arabia. We know that, that there was a massive fallout between the previous Saudi King Abdullah and Turkey about the Muslim Brotherhood. Now that has been rectified by uh, uh, Mohammed bin Naif, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who actually managed to uh, convince Qatar that they need to stand uh, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, in order to actually severely undermine, if not uh, follow and pursue their obsessive pursuit of actually mm. regime change in Saudi Arabia. So Turkey has been working and providing the logistical support while mm. all the money but, 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 but at the same time, the, t the Turks would argue Arabia that they have, they have taken in hundreds of thousands, up to millions of Syrian refugees. They've provided them with shelter, they've supported a legitimate revolution against the Assad-led government, and that they are well within their right to support these rebel groups in Syria, and they're participating in the war against ISIS in the way that they seem necessary without harming their own interests. How much logic do you think there is in this Turkish policy? Well, it's absolutely illogical. It hasn't got a leg to stand on. Uh, Syria is a sovereign country. Mm. It has its own elected government, and it's up to the people to decide who do actually who governs them. And they had an elections, and they could have removed the government if they didn't wish to. Now, for Turkey to actually meddle and uh, position itself, or gives it the right, uh, uh, gives itself mm. the right to actually impose its own will okay. and to allow and to hmm. be to use its uh, uh uh, uh, to use these borders uh, by adopting an open mm. border policy for the Saudis and Qataris to send hardline Wahhabi Salafi mercenaries through the Turkish border and provide them with the logistical support that is a flagrant and a blatant violation of international mm. law. It okay, it, it okay, if you hold your thought for a second. It Eric, cannot be supported because that would give the right to any government in the Middle East okay, to actually okay. intervene and meddle into their own okay, affairs okay. of Turkey. Okay, Eric, if we could take this to you. Now, we understand the US is now kind of fighting a war of shadows within the region. Covert operations and everything's being done in secret. Now, how much truth is there to this? Is this a kind of spy war which is happening in the Middle East? Well, absolutely. The United States wages wars like this all the time, and it's done it in the region consistently for years, and it's escalated that very much in recent years, and Syria has been one of the main theaters of conflict. Um, some would call it a proxy war, where the United States uses proxy uh, armies of terrorists and others to carry out its uh, campaign, but also the United States is actually heavily involved on the ground in both Syria and Iraq. We know that uh, U.S. Uh, special forces, U.S so-called trainers have been on the ground working not only with the Iraqi military forces, but also working with some of the tribal groups, the Sunnis, as well as the Kurds, 
They've been involved in fomenting this conflict, fomenting divisions inside of Iraq, such as we've seen the product of that in Ramadi. The United States mm. government has actually openly t uh, called for and actually has bills pending in the U.S. Congress to arm Sunni mm. factions and Kurdish factions outside of the legal authority of the government in Baghdad. So what the United States is doing, not only are they waging war covertly, they're actually working directly to undermine the political cohesion and political stability of a country like Iraq. See, mm. in Syria, the difference is the United States doesn't have any sway with the government. The United States cannot dictate policy to the Assad government. Uh, it cannot uh, really change the balance of power on the ground other than perhaps with airstrikes and other things like this and with its proxy forces. In Iraq, on the other hand, the United States is actually able to undermine the government. It's able to hmm. sow divisions so, so and Eric, discord so Eric, among the various groups. Given the differences and the changes which have been occurring within the Middle East, do you think the, the deal which Iran has made with the United States and the, and, and the largest, most significant countries in the world will have any impact on US policy within the Middle East? Well, it could have an impact, but it depends on what sort of an impact we're mm. talking about. Remember that uh, the, the main fight against ISIS and against the uh, Wahhabi extremist networks is actually not coming from the United States. It's coming from Iran, and it's coming from the forces that the Iranians have supported inside of Iraq. Uh, the most successful campaigns have been waged by the militias in mm. Iraq, which have pushed back ISIS and pushed back the extremists. And so what the uh, deal with Iran is actually about is not so much bringing peace to the Middle East, but it's about changing the nature of the relationship between the United States and Iran. What they would like to do is to be able to have leverage against what Iran's interests are in a place like Iraq. They, they'd like to just, be just able really to briefly, just transform really briefly, the very nature the of their question. relationship. Mm. Is, is it now time, in your opinion, for a reconciliation to occur between the US and President Assad, or has that particular ship sailed long ago? Well, there cannot be uh, any kind of a reconciliation unless the war is ended. And quite mm. frankly, the war cannot end unless the United States forces its NATO ally in Turkey, as well as its GCC allies in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, to cut off the weapons, to cut off the funding, to cut off the terror networks. The bottom line is, if Turkey were to shut its doors to these terrorists, and if Saudi Arabia were to cut off the bank accounts and cut off the funding and the weapons, mm. this war would be ended very quickly because the Syrian Arab army has shown Shown repeatedly mm. that they're able to essentially wipe the floor with ISIS and Al Nusra and all of these other groups if they're given a chance. But the point is, the United States wants to continue fomenting this war, and that's really the central issue. That's the central conflict here. As long as the war continues to be fomented and those terror networks are open and the floodgates are allowed to stay open, the war continues, mm. and the United mm. States mm. understands this perfectly. Okay, Eric Dreitzer a geopolitical analyst and founder of StopImperialism.org joined us online. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, Zaid Laisa, one question. How, how deep-rooted is ISIS within Iraq? I mean, is it embedded into society to such an extent that it, 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 it's, a, it's a cancer which cannot be eradicated? Or, or is there a true solution which can be found from a social perspective in Iraq? Well, I mean, uh, ISIS w and its predecessor, I mean, we can take the example of what happened to Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2008. As I said previously, it was on its back foot, it was reeling and on the verge of utter and complete collapse. It was only the Saudis and the Qataris using what was happening in Syria and their obsessive pursuit of regime change in Syria to actually offer them a window of opportunity to stand back on its own feet by reviving and reinvigorating mm. ISIS and then sending it back to Iraq. We've seen that in Iraq that the popular mobilization forces, again a force that's fully capable of uh, taking on and actually standing up and fighting ISIS, have been severely undermined by the Americans who first of all resisted their uh, attack against Tikrit and tried to stop it in its 
extract and then influence the Prime Minister to actually uh, co uh, to, to pull them back mm. from the offensive on Tikri and okay. to launch a few airstrikes uh, and then when that, uh, that didn't work they actually mm. the Prime Minister went discreetly back to the popular mobilization forces and asked them and pleaded with them to actually oust ISIS from Tikri. Now what okay. happened in Ramadi it was deliberate by the Americans they wanted to forestall the, the, the on offensive by the popular mobilization force mm. on Anbar which was actually a Saudi red line. The okay, Saudi hold that thought for one second, Mr. Isa. We'll get back to you on this issue. But now we're joined by a journalist and political analyst, Caleb Mopan, joining us now from New York. Hi, Caleb. Um, how do you see U.S. policy towards ISIS? Well, as much as U.S. officials like to hold up ISIS and say it's an example of the kind of terrorism and extremism they want to fight and use ISIS to justify their drone strike program, uh, when it gets down to it, the U.S. has no real interest in fighting ISIS because all the people that ISIS is attacking are all people that the U.S. also has a long record of hostility to. Uh, ISIS is fighting the Shia community in Iraq, which is sympathetic mm. to Iran. It's fighting the Syrian Arab Republic. Um, uh, look, they've even said, they've even gone as far to say uh, ISIS has declared God has commanded us never to attack Israel. I mean, ISIS only goes around attacking people that the U.S. also has hostility to. And much of their weapons and funding is coming from Saudi Arabia. The, the money is coming from in. in uh, weapons are coming to them uh, from Turkey, uh, you know, um, another U.S.-aligned country. ISIS is very, very convenient for the people who run the United States. Uh, the big bankers on Wall Street love ISIS and want to do everything they can to kind of perpetuate their activities in order to justify U.S. military intervention in the region and see them attack uh, people in the region who are standing up for their independence. Has the U.S., in your opinion, acted differently to the threat of ISIS in Iraq in comparison with Syria? Which is the most important to actual U.S. interest in the regions, in your opinion? Oh, well, absolutely. Uh, you know, ISIS, ISIS origins are with the so-called Free Syrian Army that the U.S. has been giving loads and loads of weapons and funding to since day one. Um, it's been revealed that over $1 billion has been spent in training camps for Takfiri extremists in Jordan, which then go to Syria to engage in extremist violence, kidnapping, torture. And 50% of the, of, the, of the ISIS fighters are former members of the Free Syrian Army, from what I understand. So uh, for a long time, the U.S. has been coddling and training the kind of extremist forces that eventually went on to form ISIS. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you think airstrikes have had a positive or negative effect? Well, I've seen various reports that the airstrikes the U.S. is conducting are not really fighting ISIS, especially the airstrikes in Syria are actually uh, targeting the uh, infrastructure that's, that's helpful to the Syrian government. Um, there have been, you know, uh, pipelines that have been destroyed, other infrastructure. It's not really ISIS that's being defeated by these, by these airstrikes. The U.S. is, is uh, you know, fighting the Syrian government under the guise of, of fighting ISIS. Uh, we, we see instances of that repeatedly. And if the U.S. really wanted to defeat ISIS, it could do so. Um, uh, you know, but, but we hear leaders uh, of the United States saying they just can't manage to get the f fighting force together. Oh, we haven't been able to recruit as many soldiers. It's just a joke. The U.S. does mm. not want to defeat ISIS. It wants mm. to see ISIS attack uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, mm. attack Syria, attack the Shia community in Iraq. Um, you know, in, in Yemen, we're even seeing ISIS forces that are aligned with Saudi Arabia against the Ansar Allah organization. Everywhere ISIS goes, it fights people who the U.S. Uh, has hostility to. Mm. Now, Zaid Al-Isa, um, the U.S. and the Iraqi official government have been working very closely to battle the Islamic State and combat them in Iraq. But, but how close, in terms of a wavelength, are they actually on? Are they working towards the same aim? Well, I, I do believe that the U.S. has been using its uh, pernicious, uh, pernicious role and malign influence to actually pressure the Iraqi government by threatening them that if they don't uh, succumb to its pressure and actually remove the popular mobilization forces, which America does believe that it is, it is the main fighting force and it is a major threat to ISIS. There are 
are two enemies in the region to ISIS and the American administration is acutely aware of that. It perceives them as a major threat to ISIS and that is the main Syrian Arab army which has been effectively and efficiently battling them and the popular mobilization forces which are actually coordinating and collaborating with Iran. Both are considered a main threat to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia has merely entered the so-called coalition against terror to actually veto any move to weaken ISIS. What they have actually agreed to is to weaken ISIS only to a certain degree where it remains, where it remains a credible, viable and existential threat against both the Syrian government and against the Iraqi government destabilizing it and forcing it to bow to Saudi pressure to actually establish what they call the Sunni National Guard and that's why Saudi Arabia have been vehemently opposed to the move, any move by the popular mobilization forces to actually stand up and challenge ISIS Zayd in Ramadi. Ramadi Mr. has Zayd. to be the capital of a Wahhabi Salafi state Mr. created Zayd. by the Saudis and towing the Saudi now, line. Now the Western media and the Western press has strongly criticized the Syrian army. They have also criticized the Iraqi army and they've said that it's unreliable, that it's very highly corrupted. Just how reliable is the Iraqi army, the official army, not the militants who were fighting with the army, the popular mobilization forces, the actual Iraqi army, how strong is it? How reliable is it? Well, the Iraqi army actually have took on and fought ISIS. Let's, let's be honest about it. Let's be clear. For 18 months in Ramadi, they were standing up and challenging ISIS day in and down, day out without any support from the US where their air fighters have flown impotently above head and refused to actually help out or support those ground troops. They wanted Ramadi to fall and that's what actually Damsi has said when they called upon him and they told him urgent help is needed in Ramadi. He simply said that Ramadi is not symbolic of anything. It is not central to the future of Iraq. It does not appear on the Caliphate's map and if it falls then the campaign will simply go on. That mm. was a clear, unmistakable message. It was a green light to ISIS that it could actually, could actually move and, uh, th and uh, topple any defenses in Ramadi and seize Ramadi. They wanted to see the Ramadi because they want to actually deal a devastating blow to the morale, to the momentum developed after the Iraqi forces, particularly the mobilization forces fighting side by side by the Iraqi army, which managed single-handedly to claw back to Crete, which is one of the bastions of ISIS and one of the main strongholds and home to the original Saddam Hussein. That was actually okay, a okay, okay, battle Mr. Zaid, that hold the thought for a US second. Was a to US okay. was totally against. Okay, Caleb, um, why does Obama still lack a policy towards ISIS, which is, which is clear, and more so, why does he lack a coherent policy in the Syria conflict? Well, uh, Obama is basically being forced to talk out of two sides of his mouth. On the one hand, uh, he's, he's talking about the horrors of ISIS and, you know, describing their horrendous activities. But on the other hand, he still maintains the policy, uh, which is that the U.S. has been trying to overthrow the Syrian Arab Republic and, and overthrow the Syrian government. And that requires, you know, a continued U.S. alliance with mm. forces uh, of, of, you know, similar nature mm. to ISIS, whether it's the al-Nusra Front, uh, whatever. I mean, the U.S. has basically uh, announced that the extremist groups that are trying to overthrow the Syrian government and mm. establish a, a Sunni uh, caliphate and slaughter Christians and slaughter Alawites those are who the U.S. is supporting and funding. So as much as Obama likes to talk about how bad ISIS is, he's really basically solidified a relationship mm. with forces uh, very, very similar to ISIS mm. in Syria. So, so, um, so in your opinion, Caleb, just how much has the U.S. reliance on moderate rebels in Syria harmed its policy? Well, there are very few moderate rebels in Syria. I think that's simply a propaganda point. There are mm. a bunch of people who give press conferences uh, speaking as if they are the moderate rebels in Syria, but the forces that are actually doing the fighting on the ground, that are actually killing people, that are actually battling against the Syrian Arab army, uh, those forces tend to not be moderate at all. They tend to be forces that seek to establish a Sunni caliphate and, and have you know a bloodthirsty hatred for Christians and a bloodthirsty hatred for Alawites mm. um, and are motivated by, by religious sectarian 
Syrian, uh, you know, goals. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the moderate, moderate Syrian rebels are, are kind of an, an um, uh, a fiction, if you will. Okay, Caleb Mopin, a journalist and political analyst, joins us on the line from New York. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Zaid Laysa, are there moderate rebels in Syria? Well, I, I basically would uh, rely on what uh, uh, the staunchest and closest ally of Saudi Arabia have said. From the horse's mouth, he said that we searched high and low in Syria, looking for those so-called moderate groups, and we basically didn't find any. And he basically blamed his staunchest and closest ally, saying it is that obsessive pursuit by Saudi Arabia to topple and overthrow the Syrian regime that actually led to this torrent of arming and financing and providing logistical support that went directly and he named Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Jabhat al-Nusra. He said millions of dollars and tens of thousands of dollars that found their way to Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Jabhat al-Nusra. And actually Obama has warned those countries and said, look, you think that uh, the regime, the government in Syria and Iraq and the Republic of Iran are existing existential threats. You are wrong. The main threat and the principal threat to Saudi Arabia is your regime. It is the dictatorship, the lack of human rights, the lack of democracy, and it is the Wahhabi Salafi ideology. It is this ideology which is being exported, propagated by Saudi Arabia that actually uh, supporting, hmm. back up, backing up ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. They have exactly the same ideology as Saudi Arabia. Hmm. They share that ideology hmm. and we've seen that okay. clearly in Yemen okay, where Saudi Arabia has depended okay, on okay, ISIL Mr. and, and Al-Qaeda as, it, hmm. as its foot soldiers. Okay. Now joining us is Dr. Angela Joya, Middle East Analyst, Assistant Professor of Political Economy and the Middle East at the University of Oregon. Um, hi, Dr. Uh, Angela. I understand that you've recently been back from Istanbul where you met a group of Syrian opposition members, but also with Turkish people to find out their views on the Syria conflict and pathways to resolve it. So, in light of this, how do you perceive US policy in Syria? Is it time for a new strategy, for instance? Um, speaking with Syrian opposition, um, I realized that they were quite frustrated um, in the first two years of the conflict. A um, number of them argued that they were actually under the impression that the U.S. was going to implement a quick regime change um, of the type that happened in Libya. So mm. they were in, in probably serious ways misled by the U.S. policy and the U.S. calls mm. for regime change for Assad to go away. Um, and those kind of implanted these false hopes um, among the Syrian opposition to that they would actually get power very quickly. But mm. it also, I think, um, caused a lot of complications along the way for preventing them from considering a serious strategy towards um, a peaceful resolution of the conflict. So that mm. was a serious problem that came out of that um, false impression that was given by the U.S. to the Syrian opposition groups. Um, that was the perception of the opposition groups. And um, sorry, I missed the second part, um, whether there's time for a new strategy um, mm. for the U.S. Mm. Um, I absolutely think it's, it's time for a new strategy. Um, I was also at a conference, um, which was an international conference on Syria at St. Andrews University. Um, mm. My perception is now that the U.S. is actually thinking, moving in that direction of a mm. diplomatic resolution of the conflict. Um, however, mm. Seeing the last five months of developments um, in the region with Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar um, and Jordan working in the south of Syria trying to establish um, a safe zone there, um, all of these actually give me the impression that the U.S. As, is adopting a two-pronged policy where on the one hand they, they realize that a peaceful solution needs mm. to be arrived at through, um, you know, uh, pushing towards um, the Vienna conferences, but at the same time they have given um, mm. uh, quite a bit of leeway for Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar um, in the Syria conflict so that they could actually have a, re a regional mm. solution and that was the impression also that the Syrian mm. opposition um, in Istanbul gave me. So, so from your experience in talking with Syrians, what, what type of role in Syria do you see for the United States in the future? Um, 
Well, there are diverse views, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, the Syrian opposition would like um, a more strong, assertive role for U.S. to bring about um, a change of regime, to, mm -hmm. to, to change basically the status quo for them mm -hmm. in their favor. But speaking to Syrian refugees who are actually in Istanbul, these are not refugees in camps. I went in various neighborhoods where these refugees from different parts, mostly from Aleppo, but also from Idlib, from other parts, uh, from Damascus, um, who are in Istanbul, they were... Um, they were basically asking and hoping that the U.S. would actually bring about a peaceful solution so they could go back to um, Syria. They did not want mm. to stay in Istanbul. I mean, a lot of them claimed mm. they were living in awful, horrid conditions, and they said they had their lands, they had yep. their homes. Mm. Um, Interestingly, did, did you get the impression that the U.S. administration had, had abandoned the Syrian rebels from their perspective? Or is the lack of profound trust between them, has it reached a breaking point? Um, the Syrian rebels, um, mm. again, this is from conversations with various members of the Syrian opposition, um, there was this perception that the Syrian opposition, as well as the Syrian rebels, um, had absolutely lost faith in the U.S., um, especially because of um, lack of military support, lack of weapons, uh, but also, I guess, because of uh, la failed promises where they were they were basically uh, told that they would see some kind of shift, some kind of change at the behest of U.S. And so um, increasingly it seems the Syrian opposition and the rebels are working towards a regional solution. Um, more and more Syrian rebel commanders are coming to Istanbul now um, and recently, um, just a few days ago, uh, there was the launching of a new military command um, that would bring various military commanders of the rebels um, under the control of the political opposition um, in Istanbul, but also to channel funds to them. So, in a way, uh, having some kind of influence over armed rebels inside Syria by the political opposition. Mm. Um. Okay, if we could take this to Ziad al -Aisa. Now, the United States still believes in a post-Assad era. How feasible is this for the future of Syria in light of recent events? Well, in light of recent events, and if we take into consideration the reality on the ground and the balance of power, any move to actually topple the, uh, the government in uh, Syria and to actually carry out a regime change at the behest of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and that was actually preventing and stopping the U.S. from actually putting its money where its mouth is when push comes to shove and actually backing up regime change because they know for 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 they know uh, that uh, any change at the moment would mean that there will be utter and complete chaos and that the ISIL and the jihadis and Jabhat al-Nusra are actually uh, the ones who would benefit from such a change and there will be complete and utter mayhem in Syria and it will completely destabilize the entire rage region and for the US and the West actually because mm. of the sensitive geostrategic position of Syria they are not willing to take that chance mm. and they they actually prefer to sit on the problem and actually use and exploit ISIS as one of the uh, potent weapons to actually weaken both the Syrian government and also destabilize Iraq. And that is m the main strategy at the moment, which the U.S. wants to maintain now, for now, the Now, from your own experience as, as an Iraqi, of course, Iraq is a country which has major international allies, whilst Syria is suffering from isolationism and, uh, and in, in essence, sanctions, a siege, and very few allies. Now, this is the, the official Syrian government. Now, when do you think this, this sanctioning of Syria or this siege of Syria from an economic perspective at very least, when do you think this might come to an end? Well, I, I do believe that is actually very hard to predict considering mm. that the main foes and the arch enemies of Syria are actually Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which are considered the staunchest and closest and the most strategic, uh, 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 the strategic linchpins, if you like, of America, of executing, not only executing U.S. policy, but actually financing it. So that is very hard, even with the current nuclear 
deal with Iran. We see that the, the, that the U.S. is trying its utmost. It actually is bending backwards to appease Saudi Arabia. We've seen the Kerry actually meeting Jubair and Obama actually bending backwards to appease the king of Saudi Arabia and also the defense secretary being dispatched to Saudi Arabia to, uh, uh, to soothe their frayed nerves uh, over what they perceived as a main and growing mm. uh, threat from Iran. Mm. So uh, until we see that the Americans can actually behave and have their own independent uh, mm. policy in the Middle East, which is, uh, mm. uh, it, let's say, in a way that is not, uh, mm. that not influenced by the Saudi desire to uh, extend and export its uh, style of dictatorship mm. and trying to lead the entire, not only the Arab, but also the Muslim world, will see that the U.S. will remain hostage to the Saudi mm. desires, even though what Saudi Arabia is doing is flies in the face of what the U.S. actually pretends to be. Okay, the okay, Mr. Day, so hold your thought for a second. World. Now, Dr. Angela, um, will the Iran deal actually have any bearing on the Syria crisis from the perspective of the United States, given that the U.S. and Iran are such close allies in Iraq? Do you think this will transpire in Syria? Will it be a completely different scenario, for example? I actually don't think that this is going to uh, make a positive impact on Syria yeah. or bring the, the conflict to a, a speedy end. I think um, the developments in the last five months that we have seen in, in 2015, um, the increased uh, posturing of Saudi Arabia and the collaboration between the Gulf states and Turkey, I think it probably shows that there was probably compromise between the U.S. over the Iran nuclear deal uh, where Saudi Arabia was given more of a say um, on Syria. And so from that, what I see is that in, at least in the near future, there would be an intensification of the conflict in Syria, um, especially now with Jordanian troops being uh, in the south of Syria, working with Jabhat al-Nusra, um, coordinated by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, it doesn't seem that uh, the Iran deal will actually push us towards something uh, more peaceful and, and, and a closing of, of this conflict that has been going on for over four years. Now, how do you perceive a future solution in Syria? I mean, what would it actually take to thrash out a legitimate deal to end the crisis and the conflict? Um, first of all, let me just say that I think uh, I've been looking at U.S. policy towards Syria. I think there was, there's quite a bit of ad hoc approach to Syrian conflict. Um, it probably comes from a lack of um, knowledge of the nature of social relations of various groups of uh, uh, various regional conflicts by the U.S. So it comes from that lack of knowledge um, where their strategy is based on this false understanding of what's really going on in the region. And it might not be so much that they are allowing Saudi Arabia to do what Saudi Arabia wants to do, but it might be because they really don't know the complexity of the conflicts in the region. Um, so that's one thing in the part of the U.S. and I think there's a, there should be a sincere effort um, towards some kind of peaceful resolution. And by that I mean there should be an inclusive approach to all parties um, who are involved in the conflict, whether they are regional powers um, or groups inside Syria. All of these should be included and the U.S. could play a very positive role in that um, where instead of taking sides with one group or another group, it could actually work towards a solution with all the groups. Um, and that's one thing that the U.S. is definitely capable of. But also in terms of its regional allies, um, the U.S. has influence over Saudi Arabia, over Turkey, over Qatar, um, in that it could probably convince them to actually sit at the table and maybe uh, abandon this policy of militarized regime change in Syria uh, and instead pursue some form of peaceful resolution that would save, you know, people mm. from having to leave um, the country and become, you know, over four million mm. refugees now outside of Syria. So all, there is definitely a positive role for the U.S. to play. Um, and hopefully, I mean, I have to say that domestic politics in the U.S. also has quite a bit of weight on what kind of foreign policy, um, you know, the U.S. pursues. Um, and so it might inside the U.S. it seems that Obama is pursuing a really positive, supportive mm. policy towards peace. Um, uh, that's the, the misperception yeah, of people exactly. here in the U.S. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Angela Joya, uh, Middle East Analyst, Assistant Professor of Political Economy and the Middle East at the University of Oregon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Zaid Laysa, last section with you here. So, in light of recent diplomatic changes which have occurred within the Middle East, 
is Iran now the fundamental ally of the United States in the Middle East in crisis, which we are seeing now, or is it still Saudi Arabia? Well, I think uh, the statement that Iran has suddenly, out of the blue, changed sides and became the closest ally of the U.S. just because of the nuclear deal. Let's not forget that the Americans were forced into that deal because the harshest and the most severe savage sanctions on Iran have actually spurred Iran to uh, come up with more, um, more technological advances and to actually increase its enrichment to 20%. That was uh, that uh, uh, sent shockwaves right across the Western world and America. So the sanctions have spectacularly failed. That's why they sat on the table and negotiated with Iran. And despite the fierce opposition and the strident uh, uh, attempts by Saudi Arabia to actually uh, torpedo and uh, uh, and uh, sabotage any agreement because they have perceived it as something that will strengthen Iran because of the release of the funds and the lifting of the sanction. That is the main threat to Saudi Arabia. Millions, tens of billions of, of dollars that the Saudis have begged and pleaded with the Americans not to release or if they want to release them, they should release them as stages. And that's where I do believe the difference for, from, for Syria will come from. It will have a much strengthened ally, a real ally in terms of Iran throwing its way, throwing its support with tens of billions of dollars trying to solidify and uh, trying to fortify the government in Syria and also trying to throw its weight behind the Iraqi government and behind the popular mobilization forces in their conquest and in their drive to actually push back and mm. uh, Drive okay, Zaid, last question to you. And Syria. Last question to you. How do you now see events developing in Syria and Iraq? Well, I, I, I do believe that ISIL will be increasingly weakened by actually Iran having more influence, having more power, and having the ability to back up and to put its money where its mouth is in terms of supporting and standing up by allies. And that's the main fear that Saudi Arabia and Qatar has. It has actually stood up, backed up, and emphatically supported its allies when it was under its sanctions. Now with the sanctions being lifted, that will give it an extra ability to actually stand up and defend both Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the US in terms of actually putting its money where its mouth is and it will weaken the Saudi Arabia's ability to actually support and back up both ISIL and Jabhat al-Nusra. We've seen that both the West is actually turning against Saudi mm. Arabia, particularly that the nuclear deal and the focus which was centered on Iran has actually now shifted. That's what Saudi Arabia is trying its, its best to actually tell the rest of the world that we should remain focused on the Iranian nuclear threat and not actually shift the emphasis, shift the focus on the main terrorism problem and the export of mm. Saudi Arabia's hardline extremist Wahhabi Salafi ideology and extremist fighters, which is, has to be the next battleground if the West really genuinely wants to stand up and fight terrorism and stop terrorism from being exported right across the Mediterranean to Europe. Zaid al Isa, political commentator, thank you very much for joining us. And a big thank you to all of my guests who joined me today. We leave you with a part of Syria's past, present and future. As Syria's war continues to rage, the historical landmarks give a stark reminder of how important the country is in the Middle East. Crac des Chevaliers and Kalat Salah El Din are unique examples of an age where the world looked towards the east and in particular Syria. These two castles represent the most significant examples illustrating the exchange of influences and documenting the evolution of fortified architecture in the Near East during the time of the Crusades, the 11th to 13th centuries. The Crec des Chevaliers was built by the Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem from 1142 to 1271. With further construction by the Mamluks in the late 13th century, it ranks among the best preserved examples of the Crusader castles. During the Syria conflict, the castle was under siege by the Syrian armed forces after a group of Al-Qaeda-linked Jund al-Sham militants took the strategic fortress.
Minimal damage was shown in the aftermath of the battle, which drew condemnation far and wide. Thanks for watching Syria Talks. Until next time.